It is intended to help you understand how to select appropriate fluids and the practicalities of fluid delivery. Broadly speaking, fluid administration falls into two main categories, acute fluid resuscitation and maintenance fluids. Acute fluid resuscitation is required in acute cases of hypovolemia. For example, hemorrhage, severe diarrhea and vomiting, burns or sepsis. Typically, large volumes of intravenous fluid are required to boost circulating volume. In these cases, prompt fluid delivery can be life-saving. More controlled maintenance fluid administration is typically required in patients unable to maintain adequate oral intake, for example in cases of bowel obstruction or for surgical patients in the perioperative period. This maintenance therapy replaces ongoing fluid losses and maintains hydration. There are three main types of fluid you will encounter on the wards, crystalloids, colloids and blood products. Crystalloids are solutions that contain small molecules that can easily cross cell membranes. Examples are 0.9% sodium chloride, also known as normal saline, Hartmann's solution and 5% glucose or dextrose. Normal saline contains 154 millimoles of sodium and 154 millimoles of chloride per litre. Bags of normal saline that contain potassium chloride are also available. They typically contain 20 or 40 millimoles in a one litre bag. Hartmann's solution contains 131 millimoles of sodium, 5 millimoles of potassium, 2 millimoles of calcium, 111 millimoles of chloride and 29 millimoles of bicarbonate in the form of lactate. These are all per litre. Hartmann's solution is more closely related to the body's normal composition than normal saline. Normal saline and Hartmann's are perhaps the most commonly used fluids and are used extensively in both resuscitation scenarios and as part of maintenance fluid regimes. The second fluid type is colloids. Colloid solutions contain larger molecules, for example gelatin or albumin, that remain within the intravascular space. They are therefore thought to expand the intravascular space with a longer duration of action than the crystalloid solutions. For this reason, colloids were previously popular resuscitation fluids. However, more recent evidence suggests that in practice they have no advantage over the crystalloids and in fact colloids carry a small risk of anaphylactic reactions. In general, the use of colloids is decreasing in favour of crystalloids. Examples of colloids include Isoplex and Volplex. Both contain 4% modified fluid gelatin, sodium and chloride. Isoplex additionally contains potassium, magnesium and lactate in the proportions shown on screen. The final type of fluid is blood products, which include packed red cells, platelets and fresh frozen plasma. These products need to be ordered from the transfusion lab and their use and administration must follow local protocols. For the remainder of this video, we will focus purely on the administration of crystalloid and colloid solutions. We will now describe the practicalities of administering intravenous fluids. Fluids need to be prescribed on fluid charts. The date, fluid type, any additives and the rate must be specified and the prescription must be signed. Often the nursing staff will take care of fluid administration, but knowledge of the process is important in case you need to do it yourself. First, confirm your patient's identity, including name, date of birth and hospital number, ensuring they match the prescription. Now ensure that your patient has a cannula of an appropriate size inserted. If you are planning on giving fast fluids, a large bore cannula will be needed. Flush the cannula to ensure it is working. Next, check the bag of fluid for damage, obvious contamination and expiry date. The tube used to connect the fluid bag to the patient is called a giving set. First, close the valve on the tubing. Then connect the giving set to the bag of fluid after removing the protective cap from the spike. Taking care to keep the component parts clean while you do this. Purge or flush the tube by opening the valve until fluid runs freely from the end. Close the valve and now squeeze the reservoir so it is half filled with fluid. Inspect the tube to ensure all air bubbles have been cleared. Now attach the connector at the end of the giving set to the cannula. 
and we now need to set the rate of fluid delivery. This can be done by passing the tubing through a pump and setting the rate in millilitres per hour. Alternatively, you can set an approximate rate by adjusting the valve on the giving set to give an appropriate drip rate. The drops produced by the giving set shown here correspond to 1 20th of a millilitre, i.e. 20 drops make 1 millilitre. So in this case, a drip rate of 1 drop per second corresponds to 180 millilitres per hour, or a 1 litre bag delivered over about 5.5 hours. Open the valve and speed the drip rate up to increase the rate of delivery, or close the valve to slow it down to deliver fluid more slowly. Note that the drops per mil can vary between giving sets, but it is usually labelled. Note also that the maximum rate of fluid delivery will depend on the size of cannula in place. We will now discuss some generic principles to help guide you in choosing specific fluid delivery rates and types of fluid. Again, we will first consider fluid resuscitation scenarios, then maintenance fluid regimes. In fluid resuscitation, fluid is being given to correct an existing fluid deficit, and large volumes of fluids over short timescales may be required, depending on the patient's status. Always assess the patient fully first. Low blood pressure, tachycardia, and low urine output are classic signs of hypovolemia. Consider administering fluid boluses in volumes of about 500 millilitres to adults requiring fluid resuscitation and reassess after each bolus. For elderly patients or those with cardiac problems, proceed more cautiously by using smaller boluses of about 250 millilitres before reassessing to avoid fluid overload. The initial fluid of choice for resuscitation is typically normal saline. Ensure that bloods are sent to the lab promptly as these, along with the patient's clinical state, will be key to guiding further fluid choice. An important point to note is that potassium cannot be given quickly due to its potential harmful effects on the heart. Your local trust guidelines will advise you on the maximum rate of potassium delivery, but it's typically around 10 millimoles per hour. Normal saline with 20 or 40 millimoles of potassium chloride added are therefore not typically used in acute resuscitation scenarios and must be administered via a pump so that the rate can be set accurately. Maintenance fluids are used to replace ongoing fluid losses in patients unable to maintain adequate oral intake. There are specific formulae for estimating the maintenance fluid requirements based on patient weight. A typical adult of about 60 to 70 kilograms will require approximately 100 millilitres per hour, i.e. 2.4 litres over 24 hours, to maintain hydration. The patient will require more if there are ongoing additional losses, such as vomiting, diarrhoea or increased stoma output. Throughout the period of intravenous fluid replacement, blood electrolytes should be regularly checked and the type of fluid administered varied accordingly. When planning the fluid regime, remember that adults require about 2 millimoles of sodium per kilogram and about 1 millimole of potassium per kilogram every 24 hours. A typical fluid regime may consist of alternating bags of normal saline with or without potassium chloride, 5% dextrose and Hartman solution. In this video we have discussed fluid therapy in the context of resuscitation and maintenance scenarios and have considered fluid choice and rate of delivery. There are a few final points to note. Firstly, throughout the period of fluid replacement, you should be monitoring the patient's clinical status and blood electrolyte values. Regularly review whether your patient continues to need intravenous fluids and stop them as soon as the patient is able to maintain adequate hydration enterally. Finally, this video focuses purely on adult fluid therapy. Paediatric patients require much stricter protocols which are not covered here. Always seek senior advice when prescribing fluids to children.